sorry hello this is manuel sanchez luna from Madrid to Spain, and I would like to thank to the scientific committee to give to me the possibility to enjoy with all of you during this time to talk about line protective strategies in the immature new or infant. Well, today I must uh, say that we are not talking anymore of uh, the old Yalim Rambant disease. Why is this? Well, because remember that that disease occurs because immature babies were uh, connected to the ventilator without surfactant therapy and the lungs were exposed to very high oxygen concentration. Today, we are having more and more immature babies and the respiratory problems used to be less severe because we are giving antenatal steroids, most of them. We also give less invasive respiratory support. So, less babies are uh, exposed to the immature uh, of the immature line to the invasive mechanical ventilation and most of the new ventilators are controlling the tidal volume what is the most important factor related to the really the ventilator inducing induced uh, lung injury also we have the possibility to give very early surfactant therapy so in total uh, what we are seeing today is what we call respiratory stress syndrome of maturity. That is a good combination of very mature of the lung, very mature of the baby, and um, the use of uh, non-invasive respiratory support. So less aggressive therapy, less severe chronic respiratory problems in the babies, probably. So let's go together to the labor and delivery room to know what today we are doing to prevent this trauma after delivery. Well, there are two steps in this prevention. Number one is to control the oxygen toxicity. Well, you know very well for many years that the oxygen concentration can produce trauma and damage into the lungs of uh, immature babies. Well, in this slide, you can see in your left hand side, a control group of newborn rats that were breathing uh, air during 21 days. Well, in your right hand side, you can see the lung of uh, newborn rats breathing oxygen at 60% of uh, concentration during 21 days. And you can see how the lungs are uh, very damaged with a lot of simplification of the air spaces. Um, resembly that lung of uh, babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So controlling the oxygen is extremely important from the very beginning after the delivery of the babies. But also not only the oxygen. Today we know that the use of very large tidal volumes or not producing an adequate recruitment of the lung can even more damage uh, the immature lung. So today we use this kind of uh, pulmonary function monitors to control not only the oxygen saturation but also the tidal volume that we are producing or the baby is producing by themselves and the entitled CO2 that is going to be a very good signal of the lung perfusion where the lung is well recruited and perfused. Well, in this video from um, Gonzalo Ceballo from our institution, you can see a very immature baby uh, given the possibility of breathing spontaneously with a mask on CPAP, um, you can see in this um, monitor, pulmonary monitor, that you have an tidal CO2 signal. And you can look at the tidal volume that the baby is producing spontaneously. So you have a very good uh, combination of data showing you that babies will uh, recruit, the baby is breathing spontaneously, and the babies will perfuse at the lung. Well, in this other video, you can see another very immature baby where um, the person who is uh, uh, with the baby is given non-invasive uh, ventilation, but uh, in uh, pressure 
uh, positive pressure ventilation. So in this other situation, you can see that there is tidal volume, but it's not in tidal signal. So there are two possibilities. One is that the baby's lung is not well recruited, or the baby's lung is not well perfused, or the combination of the two. So in this baby, probably we need to do something else to improve um, the lung uh, recruitment and um, the stabilization of the functional residual capacity after delivery. So I can show you how important it is to use these uh, probably new uh, strategies that's going to help you a lot to know how the baby's lung is uh, beginning to breathe uh, in a good condition. So uh, Gonzalo Ceballos in our institution this, did this uh, very nice uh, study. Well, in babies of less than 32 weeks gestation, uh, he went to the labor and delivery room and uh, randomized uh, to be used um, the pulmonary function monitor in half of them with uh, having the possibility of looking at the screen and knowing exactly how the lungs were um, refused and ventilated. Well, in the other half, randomized, uh, the babies were also connected to this uh, pulmonary function monitor, but the screen was masked. So the person who was uh, given the um, resuscitation were following standard criteria of uh, moving um, um, the thorax of the baby and looking only at the oxygen saturation. So at the end, we analyzed the two groups, the babies, and we compared data from the pulmonary function monitor. And you can see how in the group of the babies where the screen was masked, the tidal volume that uh, were used was statistically significantly higher compared to the group of the babies where the screen was visible. So the person who was looking at the monitor were trying to use the, the lower tidal volume as possible to prevent lung injury. And you can see how in the group of the babies where the screen was not visible, the total volume sometimes were higher, even than nine available per kilogram of body weight. So the consequences probably is going to be in the large uh, time. But uh, look at this also, the babies in this group of the, of the um, uh, monitors mask uh, of the screen were uh, tried or in trend to be hyperventilated with the lower entail CO2. So the risk of uh, not only over the stand of the lung, but also to hyperventilate was a combination of the two. You don't look at uh, the lung of the baby while the baby is resuscitated. And this is important. Okay, we know from many studies that the larger is the tidal volume, the higher the risk to produce damage in the lung of the very mature babies, but also is also a, a risk, a higher risk to produce uh, damage in the brain of the baby. So um, if you look at this study of uh, Gonzalo, you can see how the larger tidal volume used what all, mostly in the babies of less than 28 weeks gestation where the risk to produce uh, damage is much higher compared uh, to babies uh, bigger or larger. So this study done in Australia, you can see how when these investigators uh, divided the babies, uh, immature babies, uh, the labor and delivery room, where the tidal volume was uh, monitorized, and they divided the, the group, the babies, in those where the tidal volume was used uh, higher than six or lower than six per kilogram of body weight, then they saw that in the group of the babies where the tidal volume was larger, the number of babies who developed intraventricular hemorrhage was statistically significantly much higher than the group of the babies where the tidal volume was lower. But mostly, the kind of the, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage was uh, different in terms of in this group of the babies where the tidal volume was higher, the intraventricular hemorrhage was more severe, grade three or four. Well, after uh, the stabilization in the labor and delivery room, we moved the babies to our NICU and we tried to do not intubate any of them. If we can, fantastic. So, um, these are um, 
many uh, of uh, the possibilities that we can use. We can use uh, nasal CPAP, we can use non-invasive ventilation, and in most of the institutions, nasal CPAP probably is the first step. Well, look at uh, this uh, very nice study published two years ago from um, a survey in different NICUs in the United States. Uh, as you can see from the last uh, two years, uh, in more and more uh, NICUs in the United States, more babies are given non-invasive respiratory support uh, in the first 24 hours after delivery. So this is a philosophy that in most of the hospitals uh, are probably following uh, in many uh, different uh, hospitals. But at the same time, in these uh, hospitals where most of the babies were treated with non-invasive respiratory support during the first 24 hours, the number of babies who uh, finally developed BPD or died were decreasing. So, of course, we can't say, because this is just a survey and an observational study, that there is a clear relationship between the two. But something probably is behind that um, the use of uh, the lower respiratory uh, support is going to improve probably the survival of the babies at the end. Well, but how can we know if a baby during the first few hours after delivery is going to success using nasal CPAP, for instance? Well, this is study, study coming from Poland. Um, it's very um, attractive in terms that uh, if you look of the babies during the first few hours of the delivery and you look at the FIO2, then probably you can uh, better select uh, who is going to fail using nasal CPAP and will need to be given surfactant or uh, intubated. Well, in this study, um, they uh, observed different factors and after uh, the analysis, they saw that the group of the babies that the, the nasal CPAP failed, FIU2 during the first uh, hour after delivery, or FIU2 during the second hour after delivery was statistically significantly higher compared to those babies who were doing well with the nasal CPAP, giving to us the idea that uh, the sicker is the baby the more aggressive therapy probably is going to be needed. For example, given surfactant or uh, given another uh, kind of uh, therapy. So which kind of uh, non-invasive respiratory support is better uh, to the other? Where there are many possibilities today, you have in the market of um, um, devices, uh, different kind of them, but uh, look at this um, meta-analysis comparing different uh, strategies like VPAR, high flow nasal cannula, um, uh, standard uh, variable flow CPAP, synchronized nasal ventilation, non synchronized nasal ventilation, and high flow, uh, high frequency nasal ventilation. Well, uh, you look at this study, then. Um, most of the uh, devices, most of the uh, uh, ways of giving non invasive respiratory support are positive in terms of uh, good results. But if you look, BiPAP, high flow nasal cannula are in the group of uh, uh, ways of giving non invasive respiratory support that is going to be uh, not. Uh, very positive in terms of uh, superiority compared to uh, the standard non-invasive ventilation or uh, variable flow uh, CPAP. Well, in this uh, meta-analysis, they demonstrated that in babies around 25 weeks gestation, the better uh, way to give non-invasive respiratory support is synchronized nasal ventilation. And in the group of the babies that are close to 20 weeks, then both synchronized or non-synchronized nasal ventilation probably are going to be superior compared to other methods of giving non-invasive respiratory support. Well, what can we say about different kind of uh, CPAP 
which are the most uh, frequently uh, devices. Well, for many years, we have seen that many different kind of CPAPs appears, but uh, we know that even today, and this is very nice uh, um, uh, study of uh, meta-analysis comparing the standard bubble CPAP versus other kind of uh, CPAPs. And these authors um, review and analyze that uh, using uh, bubble CPAP is uh, probably more effective compared to a standard regular CPAP uh, to prevent a uh, failure of CPAP during the first seven days after the delivery. So keeping this in mind, probably the only uh, uh, reason why most of the hospitals um, hide away from the CPAP is because of the risk of nasal injury. Well, as you can see, um, one of the problems with uh, this kind of uh, devices compared to other standard uh, CPAPs is the higher risk of nasal injury. So it's not by itself the device, by probably the interface where uh, we are using uh, this kind of devices, uh, the problem uh, related to many times the fail of these uh, therapies. And this is probably the reason why in many institutions, um, some um, uh, babies are uh, not given standard CPAP and they are given other methods of uh, respiratory support, yes, because of the risk of nasal injury with the standard uh, devices. And because of this, appear different kind of uh, devices or interfaces uh, to give non-invasive respiratory support. So um, today, for example, we have some evidence that using nasal mask compared to standard V-nasal prongs are uh, superior in terms of uh, risk of uh, uh, needing intubation within uh, the first 70, 72 hours after delivery. So, um, in our institution today, we are using a lot of uh, nasal mask because um, you can reduce the risk of uh, trauma, uh, nasal trauma, and they are probably as, uh, as effective of, as the standard uh, by nasal prongs. And as you can see in this meta-analysis, the risk of trauma is much lower in the use of the nasal mask compared to uh, prongs, but also the need of uh, surfactant therapy. So this very attractive uh, new way of uh, giving respiratory support non-invasively probably is going to be superior compared to the standard binasal prongs. What about the high flow nasal cannula? Well, in many institutions, uh, they are using to uh, give non-invasive respiratory support this high flow nasal cannula because the interface is more friendly to the baby, is more friendly to the nurses, is more friendly to the doctors, and is at the end more friendly to the families. So uh, these kind of interfaces are using a very small, um, you know, some prongs that produce less trauma. They are smaller and very well tolerated. But one of the problems is that uh, with this kind of devices, the distending pressure is not controlled and can be ineffective or can be um, dangerous because of the pressure is not well programmed and is unpredictable because it depends on uh, the leakage and depends on the respiratory effort of the baby and depends on the flow that you are giving to the very immature baby. So when we look at the evidence behind uh, the benefits of using this kind of high flow nasal canal in our very immature babies, we need to be very uh, 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 caution, and um, we have to, to be at least um, uh, taking a look about uh, this kind of uh, uh, response to these uh, devices. So, uh, Dr. Markey in Canada, he did a very nice uh, uh, randomized study in babies of more than uh, 1,000 grams. Um, uh, well, they compare. Uh, what they call the proportion of uh, primary support, uh, looking at the time. So uh, the response of um, babies who were on nasal CPAP versus high flow nasal cannula, and they demonstrated that the high flow nasal cannula were uh, no, 
very good in terms that the superiority of the uh, nasal CPAP was statistically significantly higher. And the important thing is uh, when they analyze the results is that uh, re the risk of fail of therapy was much higher in the high flow nasal cannula group, but mostly in the babies with severe respiratory distress syndrome. So the sicker is the baby, uh, the more risk uh, to fail in the babies who are given high flow nasal cannula. Um, uh, of course, this is even much uh, more important in the babies who are small, um, less than 32 weeks uh, gestation. So the smaller is the baby, the um, um, sicker is the baby, the higher is the risk to fail using high flow nasal cannula. But we have even more evidence. This is a study from Dr. Uh, Conti, she from Italy did this systematic review, compared the effect of high flow nasal cannula compared to uh, standard uh, nasal CPAP. Well, they demonstrated in this uh, meta-analysis published uh, just um, a few years ago that the risk of fail with the high flow nasal cannula was statistically significantly uh, higher compared to the standard uh, nasal CPAP. Well, uh, what about nasal ventilation? Well, nasal ventilation is a new way of um, giving respiratory support without intubated baby. Well, uh, what is the evidence behind the use of nasal ventilation? The problem is that we don't have enough good, strong evidence about this uh, kind of basis because um, many of them are used in not very immature babies. But if you look at the last uh, Cochrane uh, review in 2017, 10 trials were uh, enrolled in this uh, review. Uh, we more uh, than one uh, 1,400 babies. Well, half of the studies were uh, used uh, with synchronized ventilation, half were using no synchronized ventilation or the combination of the two. Well, but at the end, uh, the Cochrane um, uh, conclude that there is a reduce in the risk of extubation failure when these kind of devices are used instead of uh, nasal CPAP. So probably these kind of devices are good enough to be used, um, at least very similar to the nasal CPAP. What is the problem? Well, the problem is those babies of less than 1,000 grams. So as you can see in this study of um, Burke, well, uh, he uh, review um, that uh, from uh, babies who were randomized to be given uh, nasal ventilation versus nasal CPAP to prevent non-invasive respiratory uh, failure, well, they demonstrated that at the end, there is no um, clear benefits of using this kind of ventilation compared to the standard nasal CPAP, but at least we must say that they are very similar. Well, what about the interface? Well, some of the times, uh, uh, studies demonstrated um, the kind of ventilation that you are using, but it's not well analyzed the kind of interface. Um, the problem with the nasal ventilation is that sometimes the interface is producing very high resistance, and the tidal volume is clearly reduced, but the baby's respiratory effort is not enough. Well, in this study uh, published just uh, two years ago, well, uh, investigators randomized babies who were given uh, for respiratory distress, non-invasive ventilation with two different uh, interfaces, the new RAM cannula and the short standard Bronx. Well, they demonstrated that babies who were given the standard short pedestal cannulas were doing much better than with the RAM cannula. So we need to be uh, very um, uh, concerned about the kind of interfaces that we are using. And in this study, even the babies uh, were uh, having more need of uh, mechanical ventilation during the first 72 hours after delivery when the RAN cannula was used. Why should be this? Well, this is another study where they compare the average amplitude of uh, the respiratory effort of a baby using this uh, RAN cannula. So um, you can see here when the baby is uh, breathing together with the ventilator, 
then the amplitude is good enough. Well, when the ventilator is uh, working and the baby is not breathing, then uh, the amplitude is a little bit slower. But the problem is when uh, the baby is not breathing and um, the ventilator breathes without the patient effort, then the resistance is too high and the average amplitude of um, the thorax is very low. Well, also, Professor Moretti published uh, just uh, one year ago, today, different um, analysis of the resistance of so different interfaces. And as you can see, how um, at different flows and different pressures, the resistance of this run camera is much higher compared to the standard sorbinas approach or one of the new uh, synchronous flow cannula that they, they uh, produce. So again, some of the times the uh, device is working well, but the interface is not the better um, way to keep this, this uh, ventilation. Well, what about synchronized nasal ventilation? Well, we have uh, not very uh, uh, much uh, evidence behind the use of this kind of devices. There are few of them that can synchronize well. In this case, uh, we have some evidence from uh, using uh, one of the devices that are synchronized with the respiratory ear for the baby using a flow sensor. And this study, most of them from the group of Corral Moretti, uh, they demonstrated that using this kind of devices, the tidal volume is increased, minute volume is much better compared to nasal CPAP. There is a reduce of synchrony and there is a reduce of work of briefing. So probably because of this, um, babies are doing much better. Well, we are using this kind of device from uh, many years from today. Um, the good news is that uh, babies are doing uh, very good with this kind of uh, flow sensor uh, nasal ventilation. So in some years ago, in 2016, we published our results in uh, 53 patients. And we demonstrated that we could uh, avoid uh, to use invasive mechanical ventilation in 66% uh, percent babies during the following 72 hours of delivery. So you can see we classified the uh, babies uh, where uh, this device were used elective after delivery or were you used uh, after CPAP failure to prevent uh, invasive ventilation. Well, as you can see in the group of the babies where this uh, nasal synchronized ventilation were used, elective um, uh, success were very high, um, was as much as 90% uh, of the babies were doing better with this kind of uh, device. And in those babies where we gave nasal ventilation synchronized with the respiratory airflow after CPAP failure, we could prevent even 66% of the babies to be intubated. So, at least in our institution, uh, we are using this kind of basis. But of course, many times we need to be given surfactant. Because, as you know, when you don't have surfactant, you have lana telectasia, you lose your functional residual capacity, and you have overdestation. So, look, this is a normal line of a rat uh, with surfactant and at end expiration. And you can see how. There is a very nice functional residual capacity at the end. When you don't have surfactant, at an expiration, you will see how the lung is not well recruited and you have good areas with uh, functional residual capacity, but other areas with a lot of atelectasia. And because of this, even if you give too much pressure, by non-invasive ventilation, the babies are not going to go well. And if you give uh, too much pressure, then the pressure is going, going to be probably to the good areas of the lung, producing damage in these normal lungs, and you are not going to produce any advantage because the rest of the lung is going to be closed. Well, in this kind of situation, um, giving more pressure or giving more oxygen, you are going probably to delay too much um, the open of uh, the land and the producing of very, very good functional residual capacity. So giving surfactant the earlier as possible is going to be probably the better um, uh, way to uh, treat these babies. But the problem is to know exactly when to give the surfactant. 
Most of the hospitals in Linares to Jesus for many years are following the signal of the FIU2 needed to have the babies with more than 90% oxygen saturation. In the babies who are doing uh, with uh, nasal ventilation or nasal CPAP and needing more than 30% oxygen, probably this is a good uh, signal to give the surfactant. But today we have more uh, tools to know when to give surfactant, even probably better than the FIO2 uh, signal. Well, this is a study done by Rebecca Gregorio from our institution. She is one of the most uh, um, um, knowledge um, um, about uh, lung ultrasound in premature babies. Well, uh, she uh, is very well trained and she's doing this kind of uh, studies and now in most of our uh, um, uh, fellows and, and staff of our institution, we are following this strategy to look not only the FIO2 that the baby needs to be given surfactant, but also uh, the lung ultrasound of the babies. Well, to demonstrate this, she did this very nice study published less than one year ago, where uh, she uh, looked at the babies with respiratory stress syndrome, and she uh, did lung ultrasound in all of the babies, um, look after those babies who were needing surfactant. Well, what she did is to um, analyze um, and score of the lung, and the higher is the score, the more severe uh, respiratory failure is having the baby. Well, after doing this, she compared the results in terms of um, needed surfactant or not. As you can see here, when she look at the surfactant group, the lung ultrasound score was statistically significantly higher compared to those babies who didn't need uh, surfactant. So if you look at the maximum FIU2, of course, because we gave the surfactant why the FIU2 was higher than 30%, we, of course, uh, can see how the babies that were doing worse were having uh, higher FIU2. But probably, in the first two hours, when we gave the surfactant, the lung ultrasound score can help us to better analyze to whom we can give the surfactant. And today we have some studies that demonstrated that even earlier than the FIU2, lung ultrasound can give to us the signal that the um, babies needed uh, surfactant. Well, she compared the R uh, ROC curve to know the sensitivity and the specificity of this strategy compared to the standard FIU2. And she demonstrated that using the lung ultrasound score is more uh, sensitivity and more um, uh, probably um, specific, uh, specific to give uh, the surfactant to qualify the baby if the baby is going to be in the surfactant or no. So um, today, we also try to give the surfactant in a less invasive uh, way to prevent uh, intubation of the babies. As you know, in the late 90s of the last century, the insurer technique, intubation, surfactant administration, uh, was very popular among most of the NICUs. But uh, some years after, the German group uh, described a new strategy of giving the surfactant without intubating the babies, just opening the mouth, opening the clotis, and introduce a very small capsule or um, any kind of small tube. Um, just give in a shot uh, the surfactant while the baby is breathing spontaneously on nasal ventilation or nasal CPAP. Well, today, after uh, many years, we have the evidence that at least this uh, way of giving surfactant is probably better in terms of less needing of uh, invasive ventilation compared to standard methods of uh, giving surfactant or insurance. In, in the last uh, um, meta-analysis published just a few months ago, you can see that looking at the Roman, Roman, uh, randomized controlled trials or including some other studies 
comparing the use of this less invasive technique versus the insure technique, you can see how there is a better results with the less invasive technique in terms of less mortality, less mechanical ventilation, less bronchopulmonary dysplasia, close to be also much better in terms of less necrotis and enterocolitis. Um, the rest of uh, this um, data were not statistically significantly different. So, uh, at least we can say that in the short-term course, uh, this kind of techniques are uh, useful. But what about long-term follow-up? Well, we did this study, because we have been using this technique for many years. Um, we followed babies that we began to use the, the lights out, less invasive surfactant administration, and we compared babies with the insurance technique and the lights out technique. Elena Market did this uh, follow-up study Looking at the babies after 24 months of, of age, what was she demonstrated is that the LISA technique compared to Nishur was very safe because exactly no uh, statistically significant difference in terms of uh, neurodevelopmental outcome were in between the two uh, um, uh, the, uh, versus uh, the LISA compared to the insurance technique. So we can say that in the at least 24 months of the follow-up, this technique is not producing any uh, side effects in terms of neurodevelopmental outcome. So most of the studies have been, uh, have been using uh, Curasurf as uh, the surfactant to be given by less invasive surfactant administration. We began to use Veractan as well. As you know, the amount of surfactant is much higher, but the distribution probably is much better. So um, um, today we are using uh, Curasurf also, but uh, we wanted to review um, um, those studies that were using only Baractan uh, for LISA compared to those studies that were using Baractan in the standard insurer technique or a standard way of giving surfactant to know if uh, using this kind of surfactant also can be um, much better compared to the standard ways of giving surfactant. So we did this uh, meta-analysis that we presented at the PAA's meeting in the United States last May, and we saw that uh, using the Berectan by the LISA technique compared to a standard uh, way of giving surfactant that means intubate a baby and give the surfactant was uh, much better in terms that uh, we can have less mechanical ventilation and a trend to uh, follows um, a little bit uh, the combined uh, endpoint of bronchopulmonary dysplasia or death. But also if we compare LISA versus Insure, then again the use of uh, Bractan by LISA is much better than Insure in terms of less mechanical ventilation and less death. So at least we can say that using any kind of uh, the approved surfactants by this technique is probably a uh, positive in terms of um, good results of uh, short term and as I showed you before long term effects. So at the end, I want to conclude that probably there is not one only strategy to prevent uh, immature lung damage. It's a combination of multiple factors. And among them, trying to not intubate in the baby in the delivery room, monitor and controlling the lung um, uh, stabilization after delivery, giving surfactant by a less invasive respiratory uh, technique, giving uh, respiratory support by a less aggressive uh, respiratory support, and using some other kind of uh, therapies will probably improve the results of uh, your babies. Well, Cristina Ramos from our institution, who is the person who is following all the babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, did this very nice study that published just um, one year ago. And she analyzed um, the effect of uh, different strategies in two um, uh, epochs of um, uh, years between 2012 and 13, and between 2016, when we began to use uh, 
the LISA technique on 17. And she compared uh, this uh, group of babies around 200 in each uh, arm. And what she saw is that using these um, new strategies of uh, like a bundle of uh, stabilization of the baby at delivery, trying to not intubate um, the baby, giving surfactant early by, by non-invasive respiratory support and trying to prevent lung damage will at least decrease the risk of severe BPD or moderate BPD grades two and three. Um, please, uh, probably this is the way that we are going to follow during the next um, few years. Well, in summary, the strategies uh, to prevent lung damage are uh, a bundle of, uh, of uh, uh, strategies that begin to protect the lung to high oxygen exposure, to prevent trauma with uh, too large or uh, too small tidal volume. So we need to look at what we are doing in the lungs on control. So prevent uh, any kind of uh, ventilator induced uh, lung injury, giving early surfactant and being the less aggressive as possible with the respiratory support. So synchronizing the respiratory effort today probably is going to be the best strategy in terms of uh, non-invasive respiratory support, but at least uh, all of them can produce good results in terms of um, uh, stabilization of the lung and trying to prevent this kind of uh, lung injury related to the ventilation. Well, thank you very much for your attention. It was my pleasure to be in this, um, in this webinar. Thank you so much. Well, uh, that was an excellent talk. Before we go on to a discussion, I would like to invite all of you to the grand final of our Learn from the Legend C <coughs> International Neonatology Summit that we are uh, planning to host in uh, March. Now, uh, we have an excellent panel of uh, 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 consisting of uh, Dr. Kamala Ratnam, Professor of Neonatology from Chennai and uh, uh, Professor Neeraj, uh, uh, again uh, another uh, 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 <coughs> neonatology who are going to uh, uh, discuss and then we have the original legend Professor and uh, 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 Manuel Sanchez Luna, thank you so much, sir. I really uh, appreciate and we really appreciate the uh, 
and in between the sessions you are just i mean in the, you are, you managed to find time to join with us thank you so much now over to the moderators for the discussion um, thank you uh, professor manoj sir and uh, at the outset i would like to thank our the organizers for giving us this opportunity to moderate this uh, excellent uh, a uh, message or talk that was given by professor uh, manuel sanchez it was very informative and uh, we have uh, and one of one of some of the new things that we learned is monitoring uh, the respiratory function during resuscitation so uh, this is something which is new and we are just about uh, starting to use uh, tp's resuscitator during resuscitation in the delivery room So we are slowly switching over to from uh, self inflating resuscitation back to tp's resuscitator and i think if you go one step ahead and monitor this respiratory function i think uh, sir has proved that uh, our outcomes will be better and uh, many such points sir has highlighted during his uh, lecture and uh, so certain questions have come up uh, in the question and answer uh, box and uh, one of that is uh, very interesting what is your opinion on nebulized surfactant and are there going ongoing efforts to develop suitable catheters to effectively perform mast well uh, first of all i would like to thanks again dr manoka and all the organizers for uh, giving to me the possibility of joining this meeting today so thank you very much it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, good evening from madrid spain to all of the uh, the people attending the, to the meeting so the first uh, question is a excellent question about uh, the possibility of giving a uh, surfactant by nebulization um yes i'm sure is going to be the next step um probably we will have the possibility of using this um uh, technique over the next year there are uh, some clinical trials on phase 3 demonstrating uh, the benefits of uh, giving nebulization uh, surfactant by, by nebulization um the idea is not to give probably to all of the babies but uh, to uh, some of the babies who are prone to develop for rds and connected to a non invasive uh, respiratory device number 1 and number 2 probably the possibility of giving um this um um surfactant by nebulization is uh, another um, uh, advantage that probably will um keep the lung compliance uh, working so well during more time probably compared to a standard bolus uh, surfactant administration so uh, these are the two uh, points um of course we will have to use more amount of surfactant when you have to give it by nebulization because you are going to lose um uh, such a uh, quantity of surfactant not going to the lung of the baby but uh, you know the advantages is of course the baby is going to be uh, breathing spontaneously very uh, comfortable without uh, producing this kind of uh, aggressive uh, installation of the surfactant by the lysa or mist because you have to remember that probably this is just one step uh, ahead the use of less invasive surfactant but the near future is going to be probably uh, nebulization of the surfactant yes of course i do agree thank you sir i just have one more uh, I mean, uh, clarification regarding this is there a special kind of nebulizer that you use to nebulize the surfactant and do you prefer any particular uh, brand of surfactant for nebulizer surfactant <laughs> this is a very uh, <laughs> difficult question okay um we are testing different devices um by retin membrane are the most used uh, 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 nebulizer for surfactant administration there are uh, some studies coming from australia some studies coming from united states and um, from europe uh demonstrating the effectivity of this kind of devices but uh, today we are testing some other compressors that uh, can produce very small molecules less than 4 uh, micras um to uh nebulize the surfactant so in the near future we will have uh, the possibility of using a simple cheap 
um, very easy um, to administrate uh, uh, surfactant. About the, the, the kind of the surfactant, well, we are beginning to test um, the most uh, frequently used surfactants in, in Europe, uh, in the animal lab to compare exactly, which should be the dilution, you know, that surfactant normally given by aerosolized, uh, you have to dilute. Um, and the time of the nebulization and the, and the total uh, dose. So there are some very nice studies with Beractan coming from um, Michigan in the United States. Uh, very, very nice studies with very good results demonstrating not only the effectivity, but the absence, absolutely of side effects of uh, using Beractan. So um, in the near future, probably we will have more and more data coming from these uh, studies. Thank you, sir. And um, there is uh, another question uh, uh, from uh, Victoria Lima Rogel. Uh, with this evidence, our efforts will guide to the pregnant women for BPD prevention. Is the BPD a disease that was developed during pregnancy? Well, this is a fantastic question. Oh my God, probably. <laughs> Um, is one of the key points of uh, uh, BPD. So as you know, many of you, there are some different kind of uh, BPD in, in premature babies. Uh, from the earlier years, remember that we were producing what we call the traumatic BPD. So traumatic BPD was related to the use of very high oxygen concentration, very large tidal volumes with very powerful ventilators. Uh, those years uh, disappear, thanks to God. Today, we can um, prevent the use of very high oxygen concentration and we synchronize the babies. We try to control the tidal volume. So this kind of uh, ventilator injury uh, lung damage is decreasing and decreasing even more and the effect of the oxygen as well. So um, still we have uh, a lot of uh, BPD. So why is that? Not only because the baby is uh, 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 delivered very immature, but also because there is a kind of inflammation that probably is beginning before the baby is delivered. So some of the investigators think that BPD is just uh, a very um, important expression of uh, global inflammation of the immature baby. Because as you know, the more severe cases of BPD uh, also those babies do have uh, many other problems, as you know, related to neurodevelopmental, uh, immunological problems, necrotis and arthritis, or whatever. So it's not a simple uh, disease of the lung. So probably some of these cases are beginning in utero. Um, the possibility of uh, preventing infection, preventing inflammation, um, decreasing the risk of uh, sudden delivery without uh, controlling uh, this delivery probably will decrease uh, some of the more severe cases of BPD. But as you know, we don't have any drug to prevent BPD in utero. Uh, uh, antenatal steroids uh, do not work in terms of prevention of BPD. And there is no other drug today uh, to be given uh, to pregnant uh, women to prevent BPD. But of course, uh, we will probably uh, find in the next few years some more evidence about the possibility that these cases, the most severe cases, are uh, beginning before delivery of those very mature babies. Thank you, Dr. Luna. <clears throat> yeah. So we have a question related to the point at which surfactant has to be given. So as you rightly pointed out that uh, conventionally nowadays, if the baby is on CPAP of five and a six and FIO2 being 30% or more, then the surfactant is being administered. So question which has been asked is that if the baby is on nasal IMV or non-invasive intermittent mandatory ventilation, so can the same criteria be applied in terms of giving surfactant? Should the FIO2 be 30% or some other criteria should be taken to decide surfactant therapy? So from, uh, if the question is, which should be uh, the level of FIO2 to be given surfactant when a baby is on nasal ventilation? Yes, from many years, not from now, 
for more than seven years, we at the, uh, our institution uh, choose FIU2 of 30% as a critical uh, level of FIU2 to be given surfactant. Why is that? Because if a baby is needed more than 30% oxygen, this is very high oxygen concentration. And this is giving to you uh, the signal that the lung is not open at all. So the functional residual capacity is not uh, getting. Uh, today, most of the hospitals, they do agree to use this FIU2 or 30%. But as I told you, uh, probably lung ultrasound is going to improve um, the way we are uh, selecting the babies to be given surfactant because we can use uh, the lung ultrasound earlier and before the baby is needing 30% oxygen. So the idea is not to be uh, to give prophylactic surfactant, as you know, but to give the surfactant as earlier as possible if the baby is having um, incomplete functional residual capacity open. So uh, today the combination of LAN ultrasound and, and, and FIU2, uh, the two together is uh, going to improve uh, results even more. Some hospitals, in probably including our, our own hospital, uh, do prefer to use lung ultrasound um, before the baby is needing more than 30% oxygen. So um, you can choose the two of them. Um, the earlier is the better, of course. If lung ultrasound score is high, even if the baby is not needing 30% oxygen, this should be probably a recommendation to be given surfactant. And also if the baby is needing 30% oxygen and the lung ultrasound score is not so high as well, probably you, have, you can choose. So the two together will probably improve the results of uh, giving surfactant. And you have the, the, the good thing using lung ultrasound is that you can repeat as many times as you want. Uh, because it's non-invasive, the baby tolerates it very well, and any neonatologist can uh, learn how to use these uh, devices that are very cheap, um, absolutely uh, very conf uh, confidential about results. So uh, I do believe that 30% probably is going to be too much if you have a lung ultrasound score of lung damage uh, higher than you know the level you choose. So meaning by better to rely more on our facilities are there, the expertise is there. Short of that, we can continue to follow 30%. In time we develop those kind of facilities or expertise is available in the given unit. We have a yeah. question from Dr. Corrado Moretti. So <laughs> this is related to the respiratory function monitoring. The first study which you showed, where you showed that the people who were not masked so the tidal volumes were delivered very well. It was 5.8 in contrast to 7 ml per kg. And similarly, the trend was in minute ventilation. So, the question is that uh, there is a very recent multicentric paper which has demonstrated that in very preterm infants, receiving PPV at birth, the use of respiratory function monitor compared to no RFM as guidance for tidal volume delivery does not increase the percentage of inflations, doesn't increase the percentage of inflations in a predefined target range, whatever they have taken. So what do you think about it? So what's your take on that? Well, this is a very good question from my very good uh, friend, Corrado. Uh, Professor Moretti is uh, one of the most uh, you know, experienced person in respiratory physiology and neonates, and he's very right. Uh, when you do this kind of control trials, you don't find clear uh, benefits in terms of synchronized um, 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 inflation, but there are many other advantages, as he knows, and most of the people who use uh, the respiratory uh, monitors at delivery. Number one, you can prevent the use of very large tidal volumes. Uh, and this is key because uh, as uh, I saw in the lecture uh, many uh, times too large lar uh, tidal volume is not only related to uh, the risk of damage to the lamb, but it's also related to neurodevelopmental problems to the baby. Number two, you can also clearly know if the baby's lung is perfuse, not only ventilated. So you can open the lung, but if the lung is not well perfused, entitled CO2 is not going to appear as a signal. So this 
probably is going to help to you much more um, to uh, increase or do many other things that you can do in the resuscitation uh, area. But also and probably uh, the most important things is for people who are beginning to learn and teaching how to do this kind of insufflation or resuscitation maneuvers, they can see what they are doing. And this is extremely important because if not, if you are not seeing what the baby and you are doing together, probably you are going to produce more damage uh, to the baby than the baby needs. So uh, for me, there are many other advantages that probably are very difficult to clear analyze in a, in a good randomized control trial. In the trial that we did, uh, as I show you, we clearly demonstrate that using this kind of devices, you will prevent the use of very large tidal volumes, and also you can prevent hyperventilation in the most immature babies. So I think there is enough evidence to use this kind of devices to help you how to do this uh, transition from in utero to uh, ex utero and to, to get uh, good pulmonary functional residual uh, capacity in the first minute after delivery. So um, it's a very good question, but I think that today most of the uh, good um, hospitals doing resuscitation are going to implement the use of this kind of monitoring system because you can see what you are doing. Agreed. I think there is a learning. So as people start using it, they gain expertise in using it. So probably the results will automatically start coming in the near future. Sir, there is one more extension of the question on nebulized salbutamol. They had asked whether uh, the frequency of surfactant administration will increase with nebulized uh, surfactant. I mean, nebulized or not salbutamol, surfactant. Nebulized surfactant, example, weekly administration to prevent BPD. Now, will the frequency of uh, administration of surfactant increase on uh, while when you give it as in a nebulized form? Uh, can you answer that, sir? So, which is exactly the, the question because uh, I have some problems listening to you. So, the question is uh, exactly? Nebulized surfactant. Yeah. If you use it, will you have to use it more frequently? Like well, weekly today, administration. Uh, today, we are not using uh, nebulization of the surfactant still. Uh, uh, we need to wait a little bit more about more evidence uh, about the safety and um, effectivity of using nebulized surfactant. So, um, but probably in the near 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 future, and um, when I'm talking about near future, yes. it's probably next year, yeah. we will uh, use nebulized surfactant uh, to some of the babies who are doing well, and you don't want to make this traumatic administration of surfactant uh, like uh, you can you can do it using Insure or Lysa or Mist because you have to remember that those techniques are traumatic to the babies. So it's important to prevent this trauma if we can. And if we demonstrate that uh, nebulization is effective, probably this is going to be the next uh, way of uh, giving surfactant to many of the babies. But today yes. we are not using. Yes. There is one more yeah. inter interesting question. The European guidelines uh, says that you have to uh, you, you administer surfactant based on the FA2 requirement and 30% being the cutoff. But they are wondering why was the criteria of MAP of more than eight centimeters discarded? That's the question they have asked. Any particular reason, sir? Um, well, um, why? <laughs> well, uh, we 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 never ever use I mean our pressure higher than six in our babies at the delivery room. Um, if you remember, there were some trials, the famous coin trial by by Colin Morley, that they uh, were using eight mean over pressure and they did have more um, air leak syndrome in the babies with such uh, very high pressures. So in our experience, um, probably in most of the institution, if you need more than six of mineral pressure to open a lung at the delivery, probably that the uh, baby, such baby will benefit more to be given surfactant earlier instead of uh, using such a amount of uh, mineral pressure. Mm -hmm. I must remember that some years ago, uh, there were recommendations to be used uh, 
a much higher FIO2 level to be given the surfactant, more than 60%. Well, the problem is that from those years, the administration of surfactant was related to insurer technique or a standard surfactant administration. So you have to intubate the baby, connect back uh, to the bagging system or to the ventilator, and then try to extubate. So probably because of that, many hospitals, they try to increase uh, the uh, umbra or the level of FIU2 or mineral pressure to be given surfactant. But today, because we can use a very simple way to be given surfactant, less invasive, we decrease FIU2 and mineral pressure to lower than 30 or, low, or not more than six. So this is probably the reason that today we are using more and more surfactant to the babies and earlier than before. And uh, uh, another question is, is using FIO2 of 30% for at least 30 minutes a better marker to give surfactant? Well, how long do you set this target of 30%? Well, we try to get the surfactant in the first two hours uh, after delivery, if we can. So again, the earlier, the better. Um, and if the baby is needed more than 30% oxygen, more than 30 minutes, okay, this is a good indication to be given surfactant. But today in our institution, in all of those babies, we do also the lung ultrasound score. And if the combination of the two is giving to you the signal that the baby is not doing well, then we give the surfactant even earlier. So again, the two first hours are good timing to be given the surfactant. So waiting more than 30 minutes or half an hour or one hour or more is not uh, a key point for us. So if the baby is needing that uh, amount of oxygen, so giving the surfactant the earlier as possible is, is the best way. But you have to really demonstrate that the baby is well connected to the nasal ventilator, the interface is well approached or attached to the baby's nose, and everything is working well. So with that condition, if the baby is needed more than 30% oxygen, then okay, we give the surfactant as soon as possible. We have uh, one last question. Won't NIPPV give high max for these babies? So you discussed overall that systematic review the network meta analysis where you showed NIPP was better, especially the synchronized work. So the question is related that won't NIPP we give high map for these babies? Oh, well, what, what, which is the question? Excuse me. NIV, NIV. Yes, uh, yes, NIV. So that yeah, is going to be high maps for these babies. High maps. Well, uh, high mineral pressure. You yeah, are mean telling me. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, we today are using more and more nasal ventilation, synchronized or not synchronized, depending on how many devices we have uh, uh, today in, in, the, in the unit. So mineral pressure probably is not the key point because uh, as you know, during nasal ventilation, you have a lot of leakage. The baby is uh, breathing spontaneously. The baby open the mouth. Um, we have a lot of advantages, but uh, keeping the pressure at least in six of uh, CPAP or in six of PEEP during nasal ventilation is the way we try to do it. So again, we try to, to maintain during the nasal ventilation the same mineral pressure than the CPAP. The only thing is that when you produce the signal of pressure, of course you increase uh, the pressure during a very short time, but this is not transmitted into the lung, as, as you know, in the same way as if the baby is intubated. So you never know exactly which is the mineral pressure transmitted into the lung of the baby who is connected to non-invasive ventilator. We try to do not give more than 25 of uh, PIP and keep the six as uh, the minimal and constant uh, CPAP level uh, during nasal ventilation. So the uh, more question that is, if you have not, if you have not been able to give surfactant early, so then is there any timeline or any limit that by where that time you can give surfactant later on? Well, not at all. But you have to remember that most of the premature babies will produce their own surfactant in two to three days, as you know. So the problem is that if you prolong too much, 
the exposure to a high oxygen concentration or high tidal volumes during invasive mechanical ventilation or too high pressure during nasal ventilation, then what you are doing is damaging the lung. So of course, uh, again, the earlier you open the lung, the better for the baby's lung. So this is the, this is the question. So of course you can wait one and a half day if you want, but probably that baby is going to be exposed to too much risk in terms of very high FiO2 to the small areas of the lung who are open. You have to remember that when the baby is uh, uh, not connected to the ventilator, but breathing a very high oxygen concentration, this is because some of the areas of the lung are closed, are atelectasic. So the other, the, what we call the good areas of the lung are exposed to very large tidal volumes and very high oxygen concentration. So in these areas, you are producing a tremendous inflammation. So the earlier you improve uh, the lung volume, the better for the baby. So this is the comment. So this is the question. So do not damage uh, the good areas of the lung too much. So my last question from my side, I just want to know, are you using NIMV as a primary mode in your uh, unit? Like you have stabilized the baby on TPC resuscitator in the delivery? Well, today, yes. Yeah. And then given surfactant based on your ultrasound or FIO2 or a combination of whatever criteria. Now, suppose the baby is not maintaining, the baby has still increased work of breathing. So let's say that you have a 27-weeker 20, baby and you, are, you have given surfactant at one and a half hours of age. And now you're sitting at a CPAP of six centimeter if I found to being around 40 to 45 percent with still uh, Silverman and Edison score maybe around two or three. Uh, so in this situation, uh, do you shift them to NIPPV or you directly intubate these babies? Well, we try to use um, nasal ventilation instead of CPAP in most of the more immature babies. Uh, because we know that we will decrease the dead space of the mouth and the nasopharyngeal area just because you are ventilated. So you decrease probably the rebreathing of uh, expiratory CO2 that the baby is uh, breathing spontaneously when the baby is on nasal CPAP, number one. Number two, you are uh, signaling the baby uh, to breathe spontaneously. So we do prefer to use nasal ventilation in most of the babies today. Um, of course, if the baby is uh, doing well and doing well with the nasal CPAP, standard CPAP, then we keep the baby on nasal CPAP. But if the baby is not doing uh, well or the baby is very immature, then we put the baby uh, uh, very fast to nasal ventilation. And if the baby still needs higher FIU2 than 30%, or the lung ultrasound is giving to us the signal that the baby's lung is uh, collapsed, then we give surfactant very early. And we keep the baby on nasal ventilation after the surfactant administration as well. And sir, uh, what is the interface do you use? You prefer the mask or do you prefer short nasal prongs? Well, we are using both. Uh, well, the problem, as you know, the short nasal prongs works very well, but the risk of nasal trauma is high. So today we are using the two of them. In the uh, smaller babies, we use nasal mask, working so well, so good, absolutely. In those babies, um, we try to uh, move or modify, you know, many times a day to prevent uh, even damage uh, to the nose with a mask. But uh, as I show you in this uh, um, meta-analysis, there, there are good data showing us that this nasal masks works very well compared to the nasal prongs. So they two together. Okay, thank you. Sir, uh, uh, sir. So there's one last question. Uh, do we have one last question is there or should we close it? It's up to Professor Luna. <laughs> okay, so sir, last question. Uh, what is yes, the criteria please. for repeat surfactant and when do you repeat? Yeah. Okay, so we have a very strict protocol. So if uh, after giving surfactant during the next six hours, uh, the babies need more than 40% oxygen, then we repeat the surfactant by less invasive a surfactant administration again. So the baby uh, after the second dose still needs uh, higher uh, FIO2, then probably we intubate the baby. 
this is the criteria. After the first dose, we choose a, a little bit higher, 40% oxygen to give the second dose. So sir, do you don't uh, take pressure into account for deciding the second dose apart from FI2? Mean... Oh, excuse me, do I, we, what? So do you yeah. take mean airway pressure also into account apart no. from no, not at all. We keep exactly the same mean hour pressure as before. So we don't move the mean hour pressure. We just look at the baby mm -hmm. and if the baby is doing well, then we keep the baby on the nasal ventilator. If the baby is needing more than 30% after the second dose, we look very closely to the baby. When the baby is reaching more than 40%, then we repeat the dose of surfactant. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank so you sir. Thank you so much. Very enlightening lecture and uh, in fact uh, many new things we had uh, come to know about uh, managing a extremely preterm baby uh, the ventilatory support part of it and it was heartening to know that bubble CPAP is still better than most of the other forms of CPAP and we can give minimally invasive surfactant using Bractant. We were wondering that uh, should we change the type of surfactant should we use only Boractant uh, or porcine surfactant for uh, Lisa but uh, from your study it has shown that Biractant also can be used to give uh, minimally impact, uh, invasive surfactant. And thank you, sir, for the uh, excellent way you cleared all our doubts, the questions. And uh, thank you so much. Sir Manoj, sir, over to Professor Manoj. Thank you, sir. So, uh, as uh, we say every time, the uh, all sweet things need to come to an end. <laughs> we get, if you uh, engage Professor uh, Luna, then we will uh, we can spend the whole night uh, because he's uh, so good at this. And we had a taste of his lecture first time in uh, in HFO. So, if you remember last year. Yeah. And exactly one year now, we are hearing again from you. It's such a huge honor and we... Uh, the, the, truly hope that uh, the tra travel uh, restrictions getting relaxed. We hope to meet you in person during the grand final, the AP Neocon, which you have uh, kindly uh, agreed to <laughs> uh, come physically if things uh, are in a good shape. Yes, so we <laughs> hope to see you, sir, in March. Thank you so much, Professor Luna. You, um, you were hopping in between sessions today, and uh, uh, really thank thankful to you for I mean, like uh, man uh, finding time for us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I would thank also like to thank you. I would also like to thank Professor Kamalatnam and Professor Neeraj Gupta, uh, the wonderful moderation. And then I knew that uh, you had to cut short so many questions because uh, the time is a very big uh, mm -hmm. limiting factor. And uh, anyway, we had wonderful time. Uh, at the uh, end, let me thank all of you, um, dear attendees. We have so many of you have joined us here in Zoom, uh, YouTube, etc. Now live and then the next 24 hours our viewership is going to be to quite high. So we are truly honored to have you all with us. More than 8,000 registrations now. Uh, and it's such a huge honor because we, because of these legends, we are able to continue the series. So let's... Uh, uh, go on to the next one in the series that is going to be i mean uh, as we were saying previously we will be uh, uh, discussing mostly uh, preterm uh, care in the in the coming days so it is going to be preterm care that we are going to discuss so like in uh, on the in the next session that is that, that is going to come up on the 25th of November Thursday, we are going to continue from Professor Luna's diagnose, uh, the, the, the talk on, uh, the talk will be on optimization of preterm birth, current concepts and future perspectives by Professor Sundeep Harigopal, Newcastle University, UK. We continue the series, the next three topics are going to be on preterm. On 9 December, we have advanced in management of ROP by Professor Anne Hillstrom from Sweden. And then on 23rd December, we have Neuroprotection Preterm Infants by Professor Kurshid Mohammad, University of Calgary, Canada, who is instrumental in forming the Canadian guidelines for uh, the same. So, uh, thank you all for joining and have a uh, good day, good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Their cramps are extremely low birth weight. So, other definitions that are used in this um, talk would be gestational age, which refers to the time duration from last menstrual period to delivery date, 
chronologic age or postnatal age, a time duration from delivery date or the birth date, and the postmenstrual age as gestational age plus the chronologic age, and the corrected age as chronological age minus the week's prematurity or premature. There's some data that I found on the preterm birth rates in India from the WHA bulletin. In India, the, the, the most number of preterm babies are born in India in the Asian continent. So of the um, approximately 25 million babies that are born each year, 13% are less than 37 weeks. Uh, about the babies that count for about 3.3 million babies each year. Uh, babies that are less than 28 weeks account for 165,000 plus. Uh, the babies that are low birth weight, um, you are less than, are about 28%, and the impaired survival is per year is about 80,000 um, per, per year. So there's one study that I found, couldn't find the details about this study, but uh, this is a study that compared the outcomes of the Indian NICUs to the UK NICU. And this was a retrospective cohorts observational study of less than 30 weeks gestational age babies from 2011 to 2015. This is a NICU from Manipal Hospital Bangalore compared to a Homerton University Hospital London. The mean gestational age was comparable in the UK cohort was 26.6 weeks, whereas the Indian cohort was slightly larger, which was 28.4 weeks. The survival of the babies of the more than 28 weeks was comparable between the UK and the Indian centers, but the survival of the babies born less than 28 weeks was lower in Indian center. The incidence of BPD and IVH was great too, was significantly lower, but their cohort was larger and the ROP was higher that required treatment. This is another most recent study published last year. It talks about the survival rate of the babies in, in, in their cohort. This is a birth cohort from the North India. They looked at 231 extremely low birth weight babies that were less than 1000 grams. And in this, they found that their overall survival was 62%, moderate to severe BPD was about 27%, and the intracranial hemorrhage more than grade two was 16%. With this survival of 62%, you know, there are a lot of preterm babies that are going to need care outside of the NICU. So when in the United States, the estimated cost of prematurity to the US healthcare system each year is about $26 billion. Most of it is incurred in the NICU care, but subsequent amount is also occurs in post-discharge care of the babies, such as frequent outpatient visit, prescription meds, uh, caring for BPD, ROP, neurodevelopmental problems, uh, and the NICU discharges these days that go home with gastrostomy tubes or tricheostomy tubes. And the other cost of caring for these babies, like special education needs and the lost employment for the parent in taking care of these babies. What led to the outpatient follow-up care in the United States? HES was one of the first um, um, investigator who published um, the follow-up studies in 1950s. He kind of uh, published his experience gaining 30 years um, of studying premature newborn. And with that survival rate that he published, the growth of NICUs in United States started to grow in 1950s and 60s. Lubchenko was the first investigator to evaluate long-term outcomes that included growth, behavior, and school performances of the preterm babies. Hinsey was one of the first author to link the oxygen use and the ROP development in the babies. And that led to decreased use of oxygen in, in the country, but also increased the neurodevelopmental handicaps among the survivors. All these events contributed to recognition of the need to monitor interventions used in the NICU and the structured neonatal follow-up program started to develop in this country. I couldn't find a lot of data on the NICU graduate follow-up in India. 
but there were some studies that did do some follow up at least for the first year. The study by Modi published in 2013, they compared the uh, very low birth weight infants to normal birth weight infants and found that they, are, they faltered in the growth during the NICU stay and they continue to lag behind um, in the physical growth uh, with the neurodevelopmental outcomes still one year of age. In Mukobata's study, the longitudinal growth of very low birth weight you know, infants during the first year of life, they found that very low birth weight neonates, especially the extremely low birth weight group, remain growth retarded at corrected age of two years. And that Z scores for weight at three months was significant risk factor for predicting malnutrition at one year. More recent, there is another study from Kerala by Sujata. Uh, in that study, they basically stratified babies into low risk and high risk and proposed that the high risk infants should be followed up um, uh, for the long term outcomes. So, although there are, there are no long term outcome in these studies either, the babies were followed until one year of age. Well, there are um, um, many uh, purposes of high risk infant follow up. Uh, following high risk um, and assessing the high risk infants can improve the guidelines and the care provided in the NICU. So you know what you do in your NICU. Is it good or needs to be improved? Uh, providing information and education to the parents and the families after the NICU discharge. Identifying early.